why don't we begin with prayer? But before we do, I want to pray tonight for Richard uh, Batiste. Uh, he went to the emergency room today. Uh, he had a leg that was swollen. They th he thought it was, and somebody maybe told them, it looked like it might be a blood clot. And he went right to the emergency room. They ruled that out. And through CT scan, they found that he has an issue going on and potential of sepsis. So uh, they've given him a very strong antibiotic and they sent him home and said, look, if these signs show up, you get right back here. So they, they have treat, treated him. They believe they've given him the medication that will help him. So let's just keep him in prayer and keep Erlene in prayer. She was very relieved uh, to at least know now what the issue is. And uh, so, you know, sepsis is serious and so is a blood clot. Uh, so neither scenario looked good, but this one's better because uh, it's treatable. So we'll keep him in prayer tonight. Father, as we come before you this evening, we're just thankful, Lord, even as we look outside, the Bible says that the sky declares the glory of God, and we look out and we see the clouds coming, and everything is working in perfect harmony, in perfect order as you designed it, as you created it. You spoke everything into existence, and the world, the earth, the, the galaxies, everything obeys exactly as it was created. And tonight, Lord, you know, when we see rain coming uh, and the rains fall, we know that it, it brightens the grass. We know that the dirt turns into mud. <laughs> and even that is part of your design. It's just obeying. The ground is just obeying you. And all of it, the scripture says that the earth is moaning, it's groaning for the return of Jesus. And, and so, Lord, we join in tonight. We're thankful that, that you're a God that loves us, that you have created us for purpose, and that, Lord, uh, we're here on this earth for a reason. Tonight, Lord, may we grow up in the faith. May we be, as Peter said, may we grow in the, in the grace and in the, in the nurture and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that in Jesus' name. Lord, we lift up those who are hurting tonight, people in our body that are, that are facing trials right now physically. I lift up Brad Cotier to you, who is just really uh, coming towards the end of his life if you don't intervene, Lord. And, and so he is at peace, total peace with whatever your will is. But we lift him tonight, comfort him, be with the elders who are actually spending a lot of time with him through the course of the day, ministering to him. Be with others in the body who are hurting deeply and need prayer and need help. Father, may we know about those needs that we might be your family, reaching out, caring for one another, practicing, practicing the one another's that the scripture speaks of. And Lord, may, may we tonight uh, just lift up Richard, Lord, that, that the infection that's allowing this potential of sepsis in his body and in his blood, we pray, Lord, that you would dry up that infection and we're asking that, but we also know thy will be done. So we, we, we know that you're a God who is sovereign over everything and nothing is kept from you. And you have a plan and a purpose even through the trials and the setbacks that we face in life. So we, are, we just glory in your name tonight, Lord. And may we study you in that same spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're in chapter 25 of 2 Kings. Tonight we end uh, the book of 2 Kings. For some of you, you'll remember, we started out uh, with this series on the kings. But we didn't start with 1 Kings. We started with 1 Samuel. And we went through 2 Samuel. And we went through 1 Kings. And now tonight we finish 2 Kings. Guess how long we've been in the Kings series on Wednesday night? Two and a half years. So we've come to the completion of those four books in the Bible. And I still am debating between a couple books where I want to go. Uh, in two weeks, we'll start up a new series. And uh, I do think I'll stay in the Old Testament. Um, so just uh, pray for me that God will just make it so clear what he wants his people to hear and to be taught from the word. And that really is all that preaching is. Preaching is explaining the Bible, 
teaching is explaining the Bible. And that's what all of us come for tonight, I hope. That's what I'm here for. So this series, interestingly enough, uh, tonight we're going to be looking at the record of Jerusalem falling to the Babylonian Empire. Uh, in the book of Lamentations, you might want to write this down, those of you who are Bible students and you're looking for extracurricular work, <laughs> here's some for you. The book of Lamentations, Jeremiah gives graphic detail to the fall of Judah to the Babylonians. And it is heart-wrenching. It'll break your heart to think about what the people had to endure in the judgment of God. I think the takeaway tonight, I'll just let you in on it even before we get started. We, we serve a God who is all-knowing. He's omniscient. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. He's all-powerful. He's omnipotent. And what really speaks to us the most is that He is a loving, merciful, gracious, kind, good God. We love that about Him. We love that God is so kind. I love the Scriptures in the Old Testament that say that He delights in unchanging love. That's how He thinks of you. He delights in you. And, and we get so caught up in that part of the character of God. And it's accurate. It's true. But oftentimes, as Christians, we don't spend enough time looking at the other attributes of God, listen now, that are just as much a part of His character and His nature as His love and His mercy. What I'm speaking of is the holiness of God, the justice of God. He's good, that's true. He's more than good. He's just. There's not a judge that has served on this earth in that role that is perfect. Every judge, no matter how good their heart is, no matter how much they desire to live ethically and morally right and to make wise uh, decisions and judgments, no judge on this earth has ever gotten it all right. Because we're human and we're born into sin. That's the depravity of man. And so we can do our best to be moral, to be good, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're perfect. You know it means that you're imperfect, right? If, if I were to say, I want those who are perfect to raise their hands, I, I would hope that nobody's hand would go up. <laughs> but, but here's <laughs> trying to pull the, the husband or the spouse's hand up. That's not, um, but here's the thing about your God that is loving and just, or loving and merciful. He is so just that the Bible says this about him. The judge of the universe must do right. He cannot give a wrong judgment. If he ever did, he would cease to be God. He would be like us. But here's what God said through the prophet. He said, I am not a man. Okay, how did he differentiate the fact that he's not a man? I am not a man that I should lie. What did he just say? All men, all women, all human beings are liars. Well, we've all lied. Nobody here in this room can say you've never lied. God can say it. So here's the thing that we're going to look at tonight. We're going to see God's judgment on Judah, on His chosen and holy and dearly loved people that He brought through the wilderness to the edge of the promised land. And then under Joshua's leadership, they crossed over into the promised land. The first city they came upon was the city of Jericho with walls so high fortified. And these people, God's people, the Israelites, were an agrarian people. They were farmers. They were not soldiers. They were not people who were, who were ready for battle. They didn't have the tools of battle. They didn't even have horses, okay? 
And God said, you just go in as my people and I will take out the enemies. Do what I tell you to do. They marched around the city and on the seventh time, they what? They blew the horn, they shouted victory and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. They never had to have an instrument or a tool or a weapon in order to conquer that great city. They were God's people. But it didn't take long before they turned from God. They began to notice the gods of these other nations that were still in the land that God had told them take out of the land, make sure you get rid of them, because they'll rub off on you more than you will rub off on them. And they didn't heed that warning. Their children married the children of other nations. They began to take on the false idols of other... Could you imagine having known because your parents told you, you were maybe not even born yet, but your parents were there when God opened the Red Sea and you crossed over on dry ground. And then that same Red Sea, after the last Israelite crossed over, swallowed up Pharaoh's army. And the parents saw it. And now you know that story's real because mom and dad were there when it happened. They told you. They, their eyes saw it. You know God that closely. And yet you would give up that God for idols that are made with wood and metal and precious stones that have eyes but cannot see, ears but cannot hear, mouth but cannot speak. And that's what they did. And as I've said to you before, Anytime you put an idol in front of God, anytime you build an idol, here's what you need to remember. That idol is actually less than you. Forget about that it's less than God. That's an obvious. But it's even less than you. If you created it, it's less than you. And that's what the Israelites did. They created idols and followed and worshipped these idols that were less than them, much less in direct opposition to God. That is cosmic treason to take on other gods. And so God, all through the Old Testament, as the people are in the promised land, He raises up kings. Why? Because the people belly ached and complained and said, we want a king like all the other nations. So God gave them a king. That didn't work out so well. Next, God gave them a king of his own choosing, a man after God's heart. And David was their king. And, and all the kings, until you come down to where we, we see the, the nation dividing into a northern and southern kingdom, and the northern kingdom never had one single king that was righteous, that was a God follower. The southern kingdom had some that were righteous and some that were unfaithful to God. And we get to a point where God is constantly speaking through the prophets. And he's saying to the people, turn back to me, repent of sin, come clean. It's not too late if you repent. Look at the book of Judges. It's just a continual cycle. Eleven times, the people, or seven times, eleven different heroes that God raises up. Because the people would fall into sin. And then they would, they would be overtaken by the enemy. And then they'd cry out to God, and God would, would rescue them through a hero, a judge. And they would worship God for a short time, and they'd turn right around and go back to sin again. And so God finally, as we come to the end of 2 Kings, God has had enough. All the time that they were in sin, rebelling against Him, He was showing grace and mercy and love by not killing them. The wages of sin is what? And this is Old Testament now. And, and he, he kept sending more prophets, and they would stone the prophets. They would kill the prophets. And God has tried over and over, showing long-suffering. But the time came. He gave him warning a hundred years before that this was going to happen. And now it's happening. What we're going to study tonight is God's judgment against His own people. And it is, it is sad.
but I'm going to say another word. It's also savage what God did. And what you have to remember tonight is, while God is loving and God is merciful and God is long-suffering, He is also just and He is also holy. And He said, do not mock me. And so God brings a very hard, harsh judgment to His people. So let's look at verse 1. It says, And in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Babylon, remember now, is the great empire on the earth. It was the Assyrians, now it's the Babylonians. And, the Babel, and, and king of Babylon came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And they built siege works all around it, so that the city was besieged till the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. He would have been the king of Judah. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe inside the city because of the siege, so severe in the city, that there was no food for the people of the land. Now they don't have any food. And they can't get out because the city's under siege. And nobody can get any food into them. Okay? So the city was under siege from January 15th, 588 B.C. until July 19th, 586 B.C. From 88 to 86, about a year and a half. The purpose of a siege was to surround a city to prevent all business, all transactions, all transporting of goods, to shut it all off. And that's what the Babylonians did. To eventually, the goal is of a siege is to starve the people to the point where they will surrender and open the gates. That's really the idea. Or die of starvation. That's the goal. <laughs> This is hard for me to even share with you. If you really want to know what was happening during this siege, you've got to go to the book of Lamentations, where Jeremiah gives us the details. Write it down. I'll read it. You don't have to turn. Lamentations chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. Lamentations 2, 20 and 21. This is, this is Jeremiah. Look, O Lord, and see, with whom have you dealt thus? Should women eat the fruit of their womb? The children of their tender care? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? In the dust of the streets lie the young and the old. My young women and my young men have fallen by the sword. You have killed them in the day of your anger, slaughtering without pity. This is the action of God in His holiness. Listen now. And He is just and He is right to do it. I, if you're like me, I, I just can't imagine how anybody would be right in bringing that kind of a harsh judgment upon someone else. But God's not like us. He is perfect love, perfect truth, perfect uh, long-suffering, perfect holiness, perfect mercy, and He allocates His attributes according to His will, and He's always just in doing it. Lamentations chapter 4, verse 10. Write that one down. Lamentations 4, 10. The hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They became their food during the destruction of the daughter of my people. No food anywhere. They ate their children. See, we cannot think of only of God as loving and compassionate. He is also holy and just. When Isaiah entered the temple at the death of King Uzziah. 
if you want to turn there. In fact, go ahead and turn to it. I want you to have this. I want you to mark it in your Bible. Maybe put an asterisk by it. Connect it back to God's acts of judgment here in, uh, in 2 Kings chapter 25. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. So I'll give you a second. Turn there if you can. Isaiah 6, 1. Again, we're talking about a God who is justified in bringing such a harsh judgment to the people of Israel that they ended up eating their own children. Now, God didn't cause them to eat their children. They did that because there was nothing else to eat. And what they did was wrong. Really, it's just them playing out that reprobate mind. They already had that reprobate mind. They had turned from God. And God's like giving them over to it. Okay, you want a reprobate mind? I'll give you one. And he brings them to the point of starvation and where a mother who truly has a right mind and who loves the Lord would go ahead and try to find a way for her child to outlive her and then she would die. They put themselves ahead of their children. God knew they would. Again, God has foreknowledge. And so he brought judgment to them. Isaiah chapter 6, let's look together here. We'll begin at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now the scripture clearly tells us that no one has ever seen the Lord. So this is probably God giving him a vision as he comes into the temple. To him, it's as real as if God were in right in that place at that time. God is there in spirit, but he manifests himself in a way that completely brought uh, Isaiah to his knees. And so he was, he, was, he, he was sitting on a throne. What does a throne speak of? If somebody's sitting on a throne, royalty, majesty, right? High and lifted up. What does that mean? He's above you. He's not even. To, when people, t you know, listen, let's, let's just be honest. I love the fact that I have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But don't ever think that even though you have a relationship with Jesus, that he's still not above you. He will always be above you. He did lower himself. He came to earth to understand and identify with our sufferings. He was in all points tempted like we were tempted, but he sinned not. He understands you, but he's still God. And he's to be worshipped as God. This idea of calling God the Father, Papa, as if it's just kind of a common, hey, Papa, good to talk to you. There's no reverence in that. We need to remember he's high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. His train. What for? A, for okay, we've had several weddings here in the church, and and uh, I hope that we have many, many more. But when a bride comes down the aisle these days, brides don't wear long train. All of them don't wear long trains. But when one does wear a long train, what does that make you feel when you see that train behind her as she's coming slowly down the aisle? And there's this beautiful train. She comes up to the steps, and then the maid of honor or matron of honor goes and takes that beautiful train as she turns and displays it, spreads it out on the, on the step. How beautiful. What does it make? I get chills, man, thinking about it. What does it mean to you when you see a bride with a long train coming into that, that ceremony? Does it speak anything to you? What? <laughs> Gordon said expensive. Well spoken by a man, you know. Ladies, help me here. I don't think there's a wrong answer here. I'm not, it's not like there's a right answer and nothing else. Can, so don't think of it that way. But what does it make you feel when you see that be the beauty of that train? What does it mean to you? Anybody want to take a stab at it? You're in awe? Okay, that's good. Yeah, it's beautiful. Okay, God's train filled the entire temple. Bingo. Again, it speaks of 
the majesty, the splendor of God. A bride's chain gets me every time. But God's train, it would fill every nook and cranny of this room. That's what Isaiah saw. Isaiah is not a bad dude. He's a prophet of God. He's on God's team. And yet, God presented Himself above Isaiah. He let Isaiah see the side of him that speaks of God's awe, reverence, holiness, a God who is transcendent above you, even though Christ came to us and we can have eminence with Christ, we can be intimate with Him, but God is still transcendent. And that's what Isaiah experienced. And so let's continue here. It says, above him stood the seraphim. What are seraphim? They're angels. But they're a specific type of angel that ministers in the presence of God. We're going to learn specifically in just a moment how unique they are because they, they live in the presence of God. And, and also, each had six wings. Think about that. They had six, each had six wings, you know. Uh, also, with two, he covered his face. With two other wings, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. Why did he cover his feet? Well, I don't know about you, but for me, my feet are touching the ground. It's the part of me that really is remind, it reminds me of my earthiness. I'm from here, and it keeps me humble. You ever heard somebody say, you know, I need, to, I need to just stand on my feet here in this thing, go through this thing. And what they're saying is, I need to be settled. And, and uh, that, that's what the angel, they are covering their feet. Why? Because they are in the presence of God. His holiness. They cover the part of them that speaks of that part that connects with the ground or whatever it is in that room. Then two of them, they cover their eyes. Why? Again, in the presence of God. He's too holy to look at. Think about that. This is your God. This is not just the God of the Old Testament, by the way. This is who God is, always. Always has been, always will be. The Bible says God is immutable. He can't change. This is who He is. He goes on and He says, And one called to another. These seraphim are flying around. And one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. So they're, they're in the midst of God flying with their eyes covered, their feet covered, and they're calling one to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. They're not saying, love, love, love is the Lord God Almighty. Merciful, merciful, merciful is the Lord God Almighty. Long-suffering, long-suffering, long... No, the one attribute that they repeat three times, which in, in Hebrew language, when Jesus would say, Verily, verily, I say unto you, truly, truly, when He re re repeat the word, it meant emphasis. This is very important that you get this. Verily, verily, I say to you, when they spoke of God and the characters of all of God's characters, they could have used any of them. They could have used several of them. They didn't put any of them up against the fact that He is holy, and he's not just two times holy, because usually in Scripture, they'll say it twice, right? O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, if you knew how much I would want to save you like a hen who's brooding over her chicks, Jesus said. But he used two Jerusalems. This is three. So if emphasis is by two, what is three? And what is the attribute that these seraphim are calling out in the presence of God? Holy. Holy, holy. If you and I only could take that into our hearts and understand how holy our God is, it would even 
raise the bar for, of, of appreciation, thanksgiving, and joy over knowing that that God that's three times holy, that's never sinned, that everything He does is just and right, that God found a way to save me, a wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked sinner. Wow. If you really want a great book to read, uh, R.C. Sproul uh, wrote a book, and this Isaiah 6 is really the focus. It's one of the focuses of the book. What is the book called, Scott? I can't remember. The Holiness of God. Get it. It's got to be probably 30 or 40 years old. I'm telling you, it's a classic. Every Christian ought to have that one in their, on their bookshelf. The Holiness of God by R.C. Sproul. You will not regret it, believe me. He goes into great detail as to this experience that we're talking about tonight. Now, let's keep going here. Again, what I'm trying to do as we close out this book is I'm trying to show you why and how God is justified to unmercifully take out and judge His people. And He's right in doing it. So if we continue, verse 4, the angels are calling out to one another, holy, 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 and now verse 4, and the foundations of the threshold. Now again, where is Isaiah when this is happening? He went where in order to mourn the death of King Uzziah? Where, where did he go? Where is this happening? It's at the top. He's in the temple. Verse 1, the end of the verse. This is the temple that Isaiah has gone into, the temple that Solomon built. And in there, all of a sudden, the foundations and the of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Wow! Could you imagine if God came in here, gave us a vision of him on a throne, and his train filling the place, and seraphim calling out, holy, 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 and then God begins to speak, and it shakes the threshold below the doors. And all of a sudden, as he speaks, smoke begins to fill the room, and no, there's no fire anywhere. There's no little smoke machine hidden over in the corner that churches use in their worship of God. We don't have to fake it when God shows up. In fact, more than that, you can't fake it when God shows up. You can't even move. All these people who, there have been people who said, yeah, I, I meet with the Lord every morning. When I'm shaving, God shows up. I see Him in the mirror. I can see him standing right behind me. We just talk. We just go back. And, you've never seen God. Guaranteed. If God showed up, you wouldn't be able to keep shaving. Isn't that true? You would fall prostrate before him. We have so forgotten or never have never known, really, the characteristic of God that he is holy. He is just. He is majestic. He is transcendent. He's above us and to honor Him that way. Well, Isaiah is about to understand it very well. Look what Isaiah says as the place fills with smoke. Woe is me. That's what he cries out. Those are the words that come out of his mouth. It's not, wow, this is so cool. God, Papa, you're so cool. Oh, no. The first thing out of his mouth, he's reminded in the presence of a holy God how unholy he is. And he's a prophet. And he says, Woe is me, oyes mir, for I am lost, for I am, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Basically, if you look up in the original uh, Hebrew, Woe is me, for I am lost, it means literally, I'm coming apart, I'm undone, I'm coming apart in the presence of God. I can't hold it together in His presence. I'm, I'm literally coming undone. 
I, I'm not trying to say that God's not love and God's not mercy and God's not... He is all those things. And those are those warm moments where we feel His intimate presence with us. And we should have that experience. The Holy Spirit lives in us. And He's God. But just don't lose the balance. He's also holy and just. And He says this after He confesses His own sin and not until He confesses His own sin then he says, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The first thing he does is he confesses his sin before God. You can't, you can't be in the presence of God and not realize how much of a hypocrite you are. The closer you get to God, the more you look like a hypocrite. This is God's man. This is the prophet who carried the message of God to the people. This is God's choice. But when he was in the presence of God, he melted. He was disintegrating. You're a man or a woman of integrity. It all fits. Your life fits. But this is not the case for Isaiah. He is not integral. He is disintegral. He's disintegrating in the presence of God because he sees his sinfulness. And then he calls out the sins of the people. Not only am I a man with unclean lips, but they are a people of unclean lips. And then look what happens. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with a burning coal and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Isn't that wonderful? That's wonderful. Now understand in the Old Testament when it uses the word atonement, it's not speaking of redemption. They weren't redeemed yet. It was credited to them, redemption, but they had not been redeemed. Atonement in the Old Testament means covered over. The sins have been covered over. Remember all the animals that were slain, right? The blood sacrifices that were given because they were covered over by the blood of the animal, their sins. But they were still having to go back time and time again. I mean, you'd see the same Jewish man walking in front of your street, heading towards the, the tabernacle with another animal. And basically what that meant was, I guess he sinned again. So he's off to the tabernacle. That's how you knew who was the real sinner, you know, the ones who got rid of most of their animals because they kept sinning, they kept falling short. But, but in the New Testament, Christ, he did not atone for you in the way that atonement is spoken in the Old. He redeemed you from your sin. You are no longer looked at by God the Father as a sinner. You are now looked at as a saint because you have the righteousness of Christ covering you. You've been redeemed. The price for your sins was completely, completely paid for. No animal could pay for the sins of man, but Jesus could. He became the sacrificial lamb. Amen? So here's Isaiah, and... He, and his mouth is touched by this, by this burning coal, and, and his sin has been atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing. Now listen to this. Okay. Now Isaiah lived in the day of 2 Kings. So that... This is happening in the period of time that we're studying in chapter 25 and even the, the chapters before, okay? Now listen to this. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, I am, here I am, send me. You just cleansed me. I'm ready to go serve, serve you. And listen what, listen what this says. And God said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. 
Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, Jerusalem, and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste, and the Lord removes the people far away, Babylon carrying the people off into exile. And the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. So what is God saying to Isaiah? He's saying that I'm giving you a message, Isaiah. The message is for you to be my instrument for hiding the truth from an unreceptive people. What God is saying is they're not going to change if you speak to them and warn them and call them out of their sinfulness. So I'm going to use you to speak the message, but I'm not going to allow them to understand it. It's not going to make sense to them. And before you go, that's really weird. What? Wait a minute. Jesus did the same thing. When he had tried to share the gospel and help people, and they wouldn't get it. Remember that? And, and finally, finally, uh, Jesus started speaking to them in parables so they couldn't understand. God knew they would never understand it. So God gave Jesus parables. He told him, speak in parables. Don't turn, but write it down. John chapter 12, verse 37. John 12, 37. And I'll read through verse 40, 37 through 40. Though he had done so many signs before them, this is speaking of Jesus, they still did not believe in him. I mean, he did miracles, they didn't believe. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, for again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. So the very verse that we're finding here in Isaiah, we find here in John's Gospel. And both of those verses speak of the people of Israel in the time that we're looking at in chapter 25. The point is, God had given them opportunity. They would not listen. They would not turn. They would not repent. So he sent Isaiah and said, I want you to say it, but they're not going to get it. They're just not going to get it. I'm going to use you as a tool or an instrument for them to hear and not understand, to see and not believe. And that's what he did. So, so now let's go back if we can. Verse 4 in our text, 2 second, uh, second Kings 25, verse 4. Then a breach was made in the city, and all the men of war fled by night by the way of the gate between the two walls by the king's garden. And the Chaldeans, when it says Chaldeans, it's actually speaking of the Babylonians. Those are the same, the same group of people. Were around the city, and they went in the direction of Arabah. Okay? But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and over... That's Zedekiah, the, the, the uh, king of Judah. And overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. And then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and they passed sentence on him. And they slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. They murdered his two sons. It wasn't just Zedekiah that was fleeing, and it wasn't just his army, uh, the, the, the king's special forces, that were fleeing as well. It was also all the king's family and all of his court, all of those important people in his court. They're all out there. They've been caught by the Chaldeans trying to get away. And the first thing the Chaldeans do is they bring his two sons in front of him and they murder the two sons. Right there, God is saying to Zedekiah, there will not be a continuation of your dynasty or even the Davidic dynasty, the dynasty of David, not in form of king. And put out the eyes of Zedekiah. They, 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 they poked his eyes out. 
they gouged out his eyes and bound him in chains and took him to Babylon. So let's break that down just for a second. In a last-ditch effort, knowing that the Babylonians have breached the wall, they're about to come in, he waits until dark and he tries to flee, Zedekiah does. At first, it looked as if his escape was successful. He was probably thinking as he was getting away, heading towards Arabia, he was probably thinking, and those, those prophets of God said that I would die. I guess they're not so sharp. I guess they're not real prophets. And then all of a sudden, they show up, and they took him captive along with his family and everybody else. Where did they take him captive? This is very ironic. Close to Jericho. So what started out as the children of Israel passed over the Red Sea, the first city they came to that they conquered was Jericho. Their first steps in the promised land, God took them to Jericho. Their last steps before the kingdom is literally annihilated, crushed, shattered, splintered, left as rubble on the ground, Jericho. I wonder if God was... I wonder if he was trying to send a message through that. When Zedekiah was captured along with his family, uh, interesting, they, they gouged his eyes out. He became physically blind. But quite honestly, it's a picture more from God of his spiritual blindness. You didn't realize that you were spiritually blind, so I'm going to blind you physically, and maybe that'll connect. Maybe you'll get it. And that fulfilled a promise that was given by God in Ezekiel, to Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 12, 13, it says, uh, I will also spread my net over him, speaking of Zedekiah, and he shall be caught in my snare. I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans, yet he shall not see it, though he shall die there. He'll never see it. So he was gouged out. Josephus, who was a historian, a Jewish historian, not a Christian, but he even records, and he said that Nebuchadnezzar, quote, kept Zedekiah in prison until he died and then buried him magnificently. And that agrees with Jeremiah chapter 34, verse 5. Now, verse 8, in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, these are very specific dates, aren't they? That was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the bodyguard, a servant of the king of Babylon. By the way, captain of the bodyguard, servant of the king. Literally, I looked it up. He was like an uh, executioner. He served at the will of the king, and he was the executioner. So this guy comes up, and he's sent to Jerusalem by the king. And he burned the house of the Lord, that would be the temple, and the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. And all the army of the Chaldeans, who were with the captain of the guard, broke down the walls around Jerusalem. So the walls around the whole city of Jerusalem, down. The temple disintegrated, literally, because it's made out of limestone, rocks that were 8, 10, 12 feet high, 20 feet long, 10 feet wide, one block. That's what the temple was made with. And how did they destroy it? They built fires all around the, around the temple. Then they built scaffolding and put more fires on the scaffolding. So literally the whole wall of the temple on the outside was so hot that it crumbled. The limestone crumbled and went down to the ground. And then they went into the ground and they mined out all the gold that was still in the top of the temple on the outside. They had gold inlaid all the way around the top. This magnificent building that was completely white, when the sun would hit it, it just shone. It was so beautiful. And then all the gold at the top of the temple brought down to nothing. And God the holy God of Israel is the one that brought it down. God did that. 
Um, verse 8, in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, that was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the captain of the bodyguard, servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. One commentary said that the Talmud, if you don't know what the Talmud is, T-A-L-M-U-D, the Talmud, is actually a Jewish writing that contains the Mishnah. The Mishnah would be the Ten Commandments in 613 commandments. The Pharisees took the ten, and the scribes took ten commandments and turned it, in, turned it into 613 commandments. Ridiculous commandments. Commandments that were more works of the flesh than works of God. So, for example, in the, in the Mishnah, where the Scripture would say to rest on the Sabbath, that, that's a holy day, treat it as holy, don't work on the Sabbath. So the, 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 the scribes and the, the priests and the Pharisees would have debates over what a person could do on Sunday and not break, break the commandments. So they would write commandments. And one of the commandments was, you're not able to work on Sunday, but if your house is burning down, you're not, able, you're not allowed to run in and out of the house carrying your items out of the house before the fire overtakes the home. But what you can do in order to save your clothes is you calmly walk in and you put on an extra pair of clothes and you walk out and take that pair off and walk back in and put on another set of clothes and walk out because you're not working then. That's how stupid, how stupid the Mishnah is. Well, the Talmud... Uh, actually records uh, that when the Babylonians entered the temple, they held a two-day feast to desecrate the temple. So now you've got the Babylonians who are pagans, and they're going to spend two days in the temple of God, and they're going to completely desecrate it. And on the third day, that's when they set the fire to the building. So the, 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 the Talmud also adds that the fire burned throughout that day and the next day. So for two days, the, the fire was burning until finally the rocks just begin to crack and crumble. Verse 11, And the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had deserted to, uh, to the king of Babylon together with the rest of the multitude, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried into exile. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. We're going to leave some of you, the very poorest, here to work the fields so that we can have the harvest. The Babylonians will get the harvest of all the crops. And the pillars of bronze that were in the house of the Lord, and the stands and the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried the bronze to Babylon. And they took away the pots and the shovels and the snuffers and the dishes for incense and all the vessels of bronze used in the temple service, the fire pans also and the bowls. What was of gold, the captain of the guard took away as gold, and what was of silver, as silver. As for the two pillars, the one sea and the stands that Solomon had made for the house of the Lord, the bronze of all the vessels, was beyond weight. The height of the one pillar was 18 cubits, and on it was a capital bronze of bronze. The height of the capital was three cubits, a latticework and pomegranates, uh, all of bronze, were all around the capital. And the second pillar had the same with the lattice work. So you're talking about a major dismantling and taking anything and everything that had any value to it from that city of Jerusalem. Okay? Um, and you say, well, what did they do with these big things they couldn't carry? They broke them up. And then they took the, the things that they wanted. Now, I'm not going to read it. But if you want to know exactly what they took, go to Jeremiah chapter 52, verse 17 through 23. Jeremiah 52, 27 through 30, uh, I'm sorry, 17 through 23. It is a detailed inventory of all that the Babylonians looted from the temple. And it's heartbreaking to read. How big is a cubit? What's that? A cubit. How big is a cubit? Uh, I, I don't remember, Steve. I'd have to look it up. I don't remember. Sorry. Verse 18, And the captain of the guard took 
Ray, these names are just beyond me. Sariah, the chief priest, and Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three keepers of the threshold. And from the city he took an officer who had been in command of the men of war and five men of the king's council who were found in the city and the secretary of the commander of the army who mustered the people of the land and 60 men of the people of the land who were found in the city. So this guy rallies them, gathers them all up. Remember now, he is the executioner for King Nebuchadnezzar. And ne Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the captain of the guard, took them and brought them to the king of Babylon in Riblah. Riblah was outside the city, about a day's journey. And the king wanted to be close enough where he could give reports and or get reports and give orders. But he wasn't in the in the city of, of Jerusalem or, or very close to it. So he takes them out to the king, and the king of Babylon struck them down and put them to death at Riblah in the land of Hamath. So Judah was taken into exile out of its land. So these are the last of the leaders of Jerusalem that were still there, and they've been captured and they've been put to death. Uh, this is so that the king of Babylon can display absolute dominion over the Jews, over Jerusalem. Okay, so that's what he's done. Now, ironically, interestingly, interestingly enough, Israel when the kingdom of Babylon was the greatest empire before this happened, they looked up to them. They thought, man, if we could just be like them. And that kingdom is the one that came in and completely destroyed them. I wonder how they thought about it after the city was destroyed. So God gave them what they wanted. Okay? So, verse 22, And over the, and over the people who remained in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had left, he appointed Jedaliah, the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, governor. Now when all the captains and their men heard that the king of Babylon had appointed uh, Gedaliah uh, governor, they came with their men to Gedaliah at Mizpah, namely Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, and uh, Johanan, the son of Korea, and Sarah, whatever that is. Uh, <laughs> this, I can't say these names. The son of Tanamuth, and Net, my good, the Netophite, Fethite, and what, whoever, okay. And, okay, and Gedaliah swore to them and their men saying, do not be afraid because of the Chaldean officials. Live in the land and serve the king of Babylon and it shall be well with you. If you'll just, just you know, humble up and do whatever they tell you and give them whatever they want, then you'll get to live. So don't worry about it. <laughs> Josephus recorded that Gedaliah had the reputation of being gentle and generous and his enemies played on that, okay? So those who were left in the region could only take the medicine that God had given them. They couldn't do anything else. They got, to, they got to bow down to Babylon, and that's what they did. But it is interesting that the prophet Habakkuk really struggled, not with the judgment of God, but he struggled with the fact that God would use a kingdom that was more wicked than God's people to bring down God's people, okay? If you want to read that, it's Habakkuk 1, verse 5 through 2, verse 8. Okay, 1, 5 through 2, 8. Now, in the seventh month, verse 25, Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, okay, we're not going to, okay, of the royal family, came with ten men and struck down Gedaliah and put him to death <laughs> along with the Jews and the Chaldeans who were with him at Mizpah. All of the people, uh, then all the people, both small and great, and the captains of the forces arose and went to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. So these are men who just came in on their own, and they took out the governor that was appointed by the, by the Babylonian king. And then the people were so afraid because, because you've got these raiding parties coming from other places, coming in because they don't have walls now. And then you've got the Babylonians that you have to bow down to. So they had off for Egypt, as if Egypt's going to be better which it wasn't. They'd have been better off just to stay right there under the Babylonians. And in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiachin, this is how this chapter ends. We're going back to Jehoiachin, Jehoiachin, who, or Jehoiachin, the king of Judah. He was the king of Judah before uh, Zedekiah. So now you're going back a king. He never died. Remember, he was taken captive. Okay? He was hauled off. 
And it says, in the twelfth month, on the twenty-seventh day of the month, evil Merodach, the king of Babylon, wait a minute, I thought Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, okay? Nebuchadnezzar, if you might, re, you might remember this, uh, uh, <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, because God judged him, because he thought he was so awesome, he, he thought he was the greatest king ever, uh, God, God turned him into, made him crazy, so he was running around in the field grazing on, on grass like a cow, mooing and cow, like a cow for seven years. Well, his son stepped into the throne. That's why this guy's mentioned, okay? But what's interesting is, after those seven years, Nebuchadnezzar came back to his senses, returned to the king, to the throne, and his son, for some reason, he threw his son in prison. Guess who his son befriended in prison? Right here, Jehoiachim, the former king of Judah. Now they're buddies in prison, okay? And so Jehoiachin, listen to this. Look what it says here. Uh, evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, graciously free Jehoiachin, king of Judah, from prison. I'm sorry, it happened while he was reigning. And he spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above the seats of the kings who were with him in Babylon because he had been in prison with him, okay, prior. So Jehoiachin put off his prison garments and every day of his life he dined regularly at the king's table. And for his allowance, a regular allowance was given him by the king according to his daily needs as long as he lived. I don't know if the writer of 2 Kings is just wanting to end on a positive note so that there seemed to be a little bit of hope left, you know, but uh, he, he, actually, he, has, he actually has to go back to the prior king and, and say these things about him. Um, the nation was wicked. God brought judgment. I, I can't help, even though you, cannot, you can't take this story and turn it into the American story. And the reason why is because the Israelites were God's chosen, holy, dearly loved. They were a special people that were supposed to display the greatness of God, and His name was to be great on the earth through them. No other nation that's ever been around ever had that purpose or that calling of God, only Israel. So we can't, as Americans, say that, that's, that this story fits us. It does fit us in the sense that America has left God behind. Uh, would you agree yep. that we now live in a post-Christian culture, no longer is Christianity looked up to in this nation. People laugh at you. They mock the name of God these days, okay? So we are in all-out, I mean, you're seeing sin and sexual sin, deviant sin, perversion sin that's taking over, and reprobate minds that are, that are in key positions of leadership that don't have the ability to know what's right from what's wrong. They, they think what's wrong is right, and what's right is wrong. It used to be that you protect the innocent and you punish the guilty. Now it's you protect the guilty and punish the innocent. I mean, we're upside down, okay? That's what we are now. So in that sense, we are like Israel, but we're not Israel. <laughs> the church is not the new Israel. The church is the church. And God's not done with Israel, by the way. In eschatological words, after the rapture of the church, there's going to be a seven year of tribulation that's going to take place on the earth. And guess who is going to come to Christ in massive number? The Jews. They're going to believe. Many will be saved. So one of the greatest, if not the greatest outpouring of evangelism will happen in that seven year period. And the primary people that will get it will be the Jews. Even though God's opened it to all of them. Everybody. So we can't say that we're Israel. I know a lot of pastors preach it that way. I'm sorry. It's not, we're not Israel. But we can learn from this story, can we not? And we can see how God brings judgment to those who, who turn their ear from Him. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and His ears are open to their prayers. But the face of God is against those who do evil. I would say that we're now living in a time when God's face is against us. And that means that judgment is happening all around us. He's letting things play out. He is letting things play out. We will not see a recovery on the earth. It's not going to get better on the earth. It's going to get worse. It is a continual downgrade. That's why Jesus is returning. 
if we could get it all figured out, then it wouldn't be necessary. But he's coming, and he's going to come on a white steed, and he's going to have a sword coming out of his mouth. He'll be riding this white steed, and he's going to bring death to all those who are against him, who did not believe in him, because the earth gets that bad in the end. Well, we're well on our way, aren't we? I don't know where we are in that process. People like to try to guess. Um, I just think that we're closer than we can imagine. But you got, I got to be honest with you. The, the, the apostles in their day, they thought they were real close too. <laughs> so only the Lord knows, right? But that's why we need to be about God's work, sharing the gospel. One of the questions that came up two different times in the questions that I said, we're going to do a Q&A next week. And two of the questions that you guys asked was, if God, is, if God has foreknowledge, He knows who will and will not be saved. And He absolutely does know. Because it says that, that from the foundation of the earth, the names of those who are saved are written in the book of life. So God knew from the very beginning. So some of you are saying, so why witness? If God already knows, why should we even have to go out and witness? We're going to answer that next week, okay? We're going to take time and go through those questions. Some really good questions, by the way. If you have another one or two, write them down. Leave them on the table right here. I'll pick them up at the end, all right? Let's close this out in prayer. Father, tonight, uh, just thank you for your word. Thank you for the, your, your goodness and your grace and your love for us. I pray that you would just help us now as we, as we take this word uh, that you've given us by your word and we would flesh it out in our lives, that it would be more than just knowledge in our head. Let it be a way of life for us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.